Where you live does influence how you create. I feel out of the West, it's a little bit tucked away. So you've got the nature mixing with the city. The reasons that you like an area are uh, often the reasons you also don't like it. I live in St. Mary's. In London area. Cambridge Garden. Or Warrington Downs. From Penrith, Western Sydney. Living here, I know sport is a really big thing. There's a lot of diversity out here. If you're not sports minded, you're not doomed for life. I don't think that one place is necessarily going to make you more creative or less creative than another. Penrith definitely is more than the Panthers. Everybody has a desire to express themselves and be heard. I've never really felt disadvantaged by living in the West. There's only five of them in New South Wales and three of them are here. I'm not a professional artist in any way. Don't discount what you find easy because it's usually what you're good at. I don't even know where I got it from to be honest because nobody in my family can draw or like nobody does art. I put it back down about 10 years ago and didn't pick it back up until my son passed away. It's about finding that part of my identity. I'm feeling quite alive and free. It's all creativity and it's all self-expression. It all holds a place in every suburb. I think we're ready to embrace art now. There's a lot of creative people out here. I was born overseas, grew up in Penrith. That's where I got my accent from. <laughs> grew up pure Westie. Everyone's got a creative side. You've just got to trust the process. I think everyone's got some creativity. Some people are stronger in their right brain than their left. Everybody's got a passion for something. It's more about self-satisfaction and pride in what you produce. I know there's so many times that I think I can't do it and I've learnt never think that. Well, if someone's not creative, they obviously don't have a desire to, to do more than the mundane. The reasons that you like an area are often the reasons you also don't like it. If I moved away, there's a lot of those gritty, stingy things that I like about this area are gone. There are a lot of flowers and botanical plants compared with the city. It doesn't matter where you live in terms of suburb or placing on a social setting. What I've found through art is that all that inspires you. I'm walking around outside near the River Walk today, just trying to work out, trying to find a subject matter, something to paint come across this beautiful old house but I'm trying to find inspiration. The Penrith area, I love how open, it's semi-rural. I don't know if you can see it behind me, there's a lovely rusty old car sitting in the front yard and there's an old historic home here with a veranda all around. It's a beautiful place here, all these trees and leaves, I think it would make a really good painting. I love history behind things. I love listening to people and their stories. Quite interesting in this area, I've got people who will actually say, oh, my grandparents lived there, or they knew someone who lived there and will actually have the personal touches to those historical homes. And you sit there and go, oh, that's nice. And that sort of draws you in. This is the placements cottage. Took a photo of a couple of years ago. Someone told me they were three years old and lived in that. That's at the back of St Mary's. I think it's called Tanner's Lane. I love my clouds and the blue skies, but I just love the mess, the organised chaos. I'll be an impressionist artist. I love the, the way light reflects off things, the change of time seasons, the contrast of light and shade. Most of my childhood was in Blacktown. I got married and moved out to Penrith. Like Blacktown, Penrith, there was a lot of buildings, dwellings, historical things. That beautiful church at St. Thomas out at Mulgar, St. Mary's and Penrith High Street. They're specifically designed, they each have a bell tower. There's only five of them in New South Wales and three of them are here.
There's so much around this area. You don't need to travel far to find it. It's just walking around in the streets. You could have that broken glass window, that old little kettle sitting on the stove. To somebody else, that's their personal life. They document it, they may paint it, they may draw it. It's something relevant to them, to their lifestyle. All those little attributes, the little things, objects, the way that we live, how we live, all that around us influences us, whether we realise it or not. I've got a confession to make. I'm not a professional artist in any way. Since I was tiny, always thought I was awesome. <laughs> you know, I'd be drawing these little people that had no body, there'd just be arms and legs sticking out of the head and I just was like, I'm amazing, look what I did. <laughs> so I just did a bit of art in high school, probably up to year nine, and I got a bit frustrated because my teachers kept scrolling all over my artwork and I'm like, oh! <laughs> they'd put marks on it, you know, they'd say, oh, you know, good here or not so good here, it sort of stopped art because I didn't want them <laughs> doing that anymore. I absolutely adore my kids. We've got five boys and we were going to be responsible and sensible and stop and then we had one more little surprise and it was a little girl which was a double surprise. So they're probably inspiration in some way. Go to bed with everyone else and then I would wake up at about two or three o'clock in the morning and I'd just paint until everyone woke up and then do the same thing the next day. It was about four years ago that I picked up a paintbrush. Before that I'd just been doing woodwork, metalwork, drawing. The school across the road that my kids go to was doing a mural and they were having trouble with it. Someone said, well, you like to do art, don't you? And I'm like, yeah. And so I picked up a paintbrush and I finished it off for them and it actually I surprised myself, it really turned out nice. Pretty much from that, council was willing to let me paint some of the local water tanks and things like that. And it just went from there. There's a few things in my life that make me really feel at peace and really feel like me. It's like time stands still. I can paint for five or six hours. I don't get thirsty, I don't get hungry, I'm just painting. I just love the world that God has made for us. I love the animals, I love the flowers, I love the trees. And I also love, I guess, community groups and individuals who do kind things. People who spend their lives serving others is just amazing and I just love to somehow capture that. Then one of the tanks has an IFS scene on it. I go through their Facebook page and just go through thousands of photos and find ones that I love and ask them if I can paint it and they're like, yeah, sure. This project is on construction hoarding around the Penrith City Park. I love that our world is full of so many different people and so many different cultures. And I thought in Penrith we've got a huge mix of cultures and it was just really important to me to have the children all from different nationalities. The original children I painted from weren't necessarily from different nationalities. One of the children is actually one of my own sons. I didn't really have a clear picture of a face in front of me or in my own head. So I was like, all right, who's volunteering? And one of my sons did, so I snapped a photo. I just changed his hair colour. He's a redhead and I wanted a little Asian boy, which my son is half Asian, but he's got red hair, so you wouldn't really know. <laughs> the artworks that I've done really brighten up a space. I guess when you put it there in front of a community, it sort of increases your pride to go, yeah, that's us. Or yes, that's where I live, that's the animals, that's the RFS that serve us. And it draws people together to go, yeah, I'm proud of where we live. I was painting the furniture out at the park and we had actually the kids from the school, they came and all helped me. And I did run into the most beautiful lady. She just walked past and she said, oh, what are you doing? And I said, oh, we're painting. And she offered to help and that was just an amazing connection. I was on my morning walk, basically being really healthy, and 
I come across this lady painting the benches and the tables in the park. I'd noticed all this artwork popping up around town so I stopped to ask her if she was the one who had created it. And then we just got to chatting and she was saying that she really wanted to incorporate some more Aboriginal art in the actual park there on the benches. It's a bit like a bit of those universal connections where timings for both of us. So I just said that I'd come in and help her. My son Harry and I just sat there in the park for a couple of weeks dotting away and pretty good time actually. I actually spent many years not knowing that I was an Aboriginal person. My mum didn't identify. As she became older she got sick and she acknowledged her Aboriginality. She wanted to find out where she'd come from and then that started me on a journey into researching. Over time I have identified as Aboriginal so the painting and the art is about my way of expressing that journey and then that's why I like to do that style particularly. It's my way of learning about culture. It's about finding that part of my identity. For me all of my art is a form of me expressing myself in some ways. I consider myself more a maker or a creative person rather I think than an artist. That's where I think I'm trying to get to is a mindset where I feel like I'm an artist. I work in a hospital using creativity and social activities to connect with patients and I'm a student and I go to university through online university. I'd always wanted to go to uni and if I don't do it now I probably never will. I haven't really developed a style and I'm just trying lots of different things. I tend to be a bit ADHD in regards to, I don't focus on anything for one time but and I used to feel really down about that, but now I've just decided that I'm just out there experimenting. So sometimes I'll do some Aboriginal art, being an Aboriginal person. Other times at the moment I'm doing, you know, some resin art and working with rocks and resin and that. So I am at this point trying to narrow it down a bit and create a style. So I think ultimately I'd probably be like a, what they call a mixed media type person. Everyone says, I can't belly dance because I haven't got the belly for it. Everyone's got a belly. If you have a belly or a stomach, of course you can learn to belly dance because you've got those muscles. You just have to learn how to move that muscle. I'm so passionate about the art form because it's just something that people rarely see. I was quite a shy person because a lot of people don't see it, but I am listed with a disability, having grown up with a twin brother with autism. And because we were kind of ostracized from other peers, I found myself dedicating to arts, crafts, dancing. It's basically the only thrill I get because I found having the disability, I couldn't go on roller coasters or skydive or anything, I found the one thing I got an adrenaline rush out of was performing on a stage. Belly dancing, totally different teaching concept. With jazz, you're telling them, you know, you do it this way, it's a bit strict. But with belly dancing, because some of the moves can only be performed when you're relaxed enough and it's quite flowy, they use a lot of meditation in it. And eventually, once you get nice and relaxed, you'll be able to learn to use muscles which you don't normally use in daily life. I'm feeling quite alive and free when I'm dancing. No one's suppressing me for what I'm doing and I'm feeling like I'm telling the audience a story, so it's similar to, say, a theatre experience, but it's all done through dance. Mm -hmm. 
Obviously, the look of people can like deter what people would think of someone straight away. Oh, in the older days, you just get tattoos to look a certain way, but I think now people are using it as an expression. With myself, like I, all the work I get done is all different styles, and I only get that because I want to learn about all the different styles and how other people do it. Like I know myself, I've got a lot of face tattoos and head tattoos, and that's my personal thing. And I still kind of worry, obviously, when people look at me, but I know what I'm in for because I'm the one who got it done, and I know how people will look at you. Because I'll probably look at someone else with a face tattoo and like covered and stuff, and I'll be like, "Well, that's." pretty full on, like, and that's my opinion of someone who's actually got it done too. I think it's art. It depends, I guess, how you look at it. Pretty interesting what people can come up with. And obviously that comes back down to the artist and what they can portray. I've been always drawing from like as young as I can remember, but I don't even know where I got it from to be honest, because nobody in my family can draw or like nobody does art. And my parents always like backed me when I was younger as an artist, like they did like little art schools or little art classes and stuff when I was in like primary school. As I got into like high school, pretty much everything I did when I was doing my HSC was to do with tattooing and art. A bit of a misfit at high school, so. <laughs> I tried to get into like national art school and stuff because I was going to be an architect and then that then obviously didn't work out and did that fine arts diploma at TAFE because it was an easy way to get into something and learn something. Actually it was a two year fine arts diploma I was meant to do so it covered all grounds of art. Dropped out halfway because <laughs> I got an apprenticeship offer. I think for my mum growing up with Asian background I was very like had to finish school, do all this stuff. Didn't know if Tatawong was a good career. Like, mum's number one fan now, so it's all good, so. I don't just tattoo, I painting, I do acrylics, I do graffiti, I do pretty much like any kind of art you can think of. I think with my background, I think with tattooing as in, in general is art, but to some people, I guess it probably is just tattooing, because that's just all they do. I guess because I've found all these different outlets, I can just, whatever I feel on a day, I'll do. And that's, I guess, why I've pushed myself so much with my art. I like the challenge of it. I like to be able to use my mind and to be able to create whatever I need to create to help it look as good as possible. When it comes to a painting, I want it to come to life, obviously, with like all the layers that comes with, with tattooing. I guess it's a bit harder because it's one shot and you don't have a chance to like go back or redo anything. It pushes you to be very precise and use all your techniques that you've learned over the years to make sure it's how you want it to look. It's definitely more welcoming these days, especially now to become more of an art form than just a culture. Like it's still a culture, but I think the art side has definitely bloomed up. Spent the last 10 plus years for people not to know who I am and now people have to know who I am, I guess. You never want to get caught and now you want people to know who you are. Penrith still got zero tolerance for graffiti and I got reminded of that every day that I was painting Judges Car Park. Those same people who dismiss everything that we're doing or the start of it before they saw the finished product are the same people who will go out and share Facebook photos of them with the silo art trail and think that's hip as. Everything I know now, colour, drawing, everything's straight from graffiti. Obviously I'm not doing graffiti, but the transition from using spray paint as the medium to doing it now professionally is hard. If you were to draw a Venn diagram, right, you'd have graffiti in the middle, you'd have criminal and artist, like, that's the separation. Me personally believe that you have to make the distinction and choose what you want to do with it. Some people make life out of being an artist through, through something they're passionate about. The, the problem is that there's always going to be graffiti for the purpose of graffiti. It's that individualistic expression that's untainted by anything. You can tell people who have done graffiti before just painting murals because there's always an element of 
speed. You've got to do things quickly because you, obviously at the end of the day you don't want to get caught. Graffiti in, in the aspects of which I've found it is all relationship building, it's finding people who like something like you do and developing style, developing technique, just in, in essence developing. So taking, taking what you do and having like-minded people who can push you to do better and to do better as a whole. But it's all just practice. It's practice, it's, I try and go out for a legal wall or paint with some people because I feel like you can't just go from a job where you paint a large scale mural and then wait for the next one. You've got to continuously develop and you've got to keep going and pursuing being better and better every time you go out. Personally, I'm someone who likes to think and I overthink every aspect of everything. I, I run like a scenario, multiple different scenarios of what can happen through one thing. But when I'm painting like realistic stuff, it's I zone out of that completely because all I care about is how much it looks like the picture. They say art's subjective, and that's probably one of the most flawed things that people can really say because good art is good art regardless, and people can generally tell what's good art and what's not. The Western suburbs are just starting to find their creative voice. In a way, the way that we perceive creativity has changed. Creativity is through movement, whether it's singing, dancing, artwork. Being creative is not just doing your drawing, it's not just doing your painting, it's not just doing maybe pottery, it's everything. When I'm creating, I love creating because it's like, for me, it's like meditating. So when I create, it blocks out everything else in the world and then I'm just purely focusing on creating whatever I want to create. Pretty much all artists will work in the primary colours red, blue and yellow. Mix up anything you like with, with those primary colours but it, it's hard work with some colours. So you have, you have some sheet colours that you, you just buy in the tube and use. There's no judgement with art. Everybody sees it very differently and what you see will be very different to what someone else will see. It's very much in the eye of the beholder. They're good diamonds, but boy, they bounce everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> it's a diamond art. Going to have a lot of patience when you do it. It's big, but it's going to be beautiful when it's finished. It's a Chauseline in Paris. <laughs> keeps me occupied and keeps me out of mischief. It's very good how diamonds stick on. You've got to go buy your chart. Very good colours. Wow. It's for Edward that works here, so he can take it home and frame it. Just doing it for him, <laughs> out of my own heart. Hope he likes the colours on it. I'm just doing it out of my own heart. St. Mary's and Penguins area, there are a lot of flowers and botanical plants compared with the city. There is not many tall buildings around in Penguins area, but lots of trees and peaceful residential areas. I get to see the sky more and get inspired by different colors and shapes of clouds. It is very helpful to get inspiration to me. Sometimes I concentrate on painting for 5 to 6 hours. Painting is the work of translation of my imagination and feelings into a picture. The process of painting relieves stress, and I get a sense of accomplishment when I finally see the end result. I'm a certified art therapist in Korea. I want many people to know that the art can bring many benefits to us. Many people today have lots of difficulties expressing their own thoughts or feelings through art due to time constraints. So they find it difficult to relieve stress this way. It doesn't have to be painting, 
but in any form of art, just make time and put it into action. My goal is to integrate art in my everyday life. For example, before my baby was born, I painted landscapes so I pretty flowers in botanic style. However, ever since my baby was born, I often paint cute simple things my baby would enjoy looking at. I love the pastel colors, not vivid color. <laughs> but nowadays, I prefer vivid color to pastel. That, that's the different thing. <laughs> I love teaching art skills. It's very satisfying to help others build up their art skills. Most of my students often say they are really bad at drawing and painting. But the more self-confidence they have, their skills are improved. Mm, that makes me happy. <laughs> Self-taught, a lot of passion, a lot of love for art. When you're being creative, sometimes you've got to look for the negatives to see the positives. I don't think it's fear. I just think that it's not knowing where to start. You can get so caught up in the fact that you think it's failed that you give it away and you give it up. Whereas if you just keep trying and see it as a, a learning and a growth experience, it becomes a different process. I think you just got to really put your mind into what you want to do. There's so many resources these days where if you want to do a certain something, you can do it. Or sometimes you're thinking too much about a final product and really creativity is not always about how it's going to look in the end. Often it's, for me, it's the process. With art, you try it and you try it again and often people will give up because it doesn't look right the first time or it's, it's not perfect. Sometimes it's just finding the voice or finding a medium in which you can express yourself. Try not to cut things off. Let the experience happen and whatever comes out of it comes out of it. I had a few lessons on the piano in between sort of raising a family and doing all sorts of other things. It gave me enough of a basis of sort of working out tunes and chords that I wanted to play and I could use what I had learnt in my initial writing attempts. I tried to spend maybe half an hour to an hour every day just walking past the piano and tinkling on around there, whether I'm writing anything or not. There was a point, I guess, where the whole process of why do I like a song. Why do certain songs sort of resonate and stay with you continuously? I got curious, I guess, as to, well, how do you go about the process of trying to put all, all that together with saying, well, yeah, is it, the, is it about the lyrics? Is it about the story? Is it about the music? In the end, what it's about is putting all those bits and pieces together. That fueled my kind of desire to start to create stuff on my own. I do all my recording here at home. Some decent studio monitors and some good digital recording software is pretty much all I need. A few mics and the keyboard. There's a whole range of songs I guess I've written over the years. The idea is to just be observational, things that are happening around you or they could be memories just going through those recollections. So the first song I ended up writing, Take Me Back to Venice. The song turned out to be basically a travel log for you know, spending three or four days getting lost in Venice and playing it for someone for the first time. There's a huge amount of anxiety. Do I, do they really want to listen to this? You're always you know, thinking the worst, then you hope for the best and usually you settle somewhere in the middle. <laughs> For me, songwriting is, is the way that I would express how I'm feeling. I wrote a few songs when my grandkids were born, you know, one for each of them. That's how I do it. If that was taken away from me, it'd be a big, big void. But it doesn't really matter where you're at in terms of your musical ability or your musical aspirations, you know, whether you're being driven by you know, success financially or, or otherwise, whether you just like me, I just, I just want to knock out a good song. It doesn't make it any less valid as a process. If you have a creative drive in you, develop it. I think there's an infinite variety of reasons why people would fall in love with music or with their own particular instrument. 
The main reason is that each of these notes or these chords, these melodies, they all carry an emotional strength for them. And so when I'm listening to music, I'm not just listening to a handful of notes or instruments placed alongside each other. It's emotion, you know, it's anger or it's heartache, it's brilliance and excitement or comfort. It's just a way to bring myself out of where I am right now and into somebody else's experiences. It's always difficult finding the time to practice because there's just so many other things that need to be done. Like at the moment, school takes up a very large portion of my time. So I, I always practice before school. About two hours straight on the piano and then I warm up my voice and then I get ready to go to school. And then during lunch I'd practice, whenever I have a free period I'd practice. Warming up is so important. Getting your body prepared for what you're about to work on. With piano, you've got to get your muscles prepared for the playing. With your voice, you could get injuries or strain it. Always think of it like as if you do a good warm up, you're going to have a good practice. What I'm learning here at the Con, it's more musical theatre based singing. So I really love Broadway, I love musicals. What do you need to do while you're sitting there thinking, just before you start? Performing's always nerve-wracking. <laughs> Every single time you perform a piece, you're embarking on this journey where you're in the position to emotionally move an audience with that music. I think at the start of performances, you're always thinking about getting things right. Once you start playing or once you start singing, the music just kind of takes over you. You don't even think about people watching you or making a mistake anymore because you're into it. You're into it completely. And like, I guess who you are just really shines through. Ending a performance feels like waking up and you see people's faces again, you hear the cheers, you hear the clap. You learn to let those nerves kind of push you to do better. There are times when it gets difficult when I'm not as motivated, but no matter how long I stop or how unmotivated I get, you know, I just, I just keep running back. <laughs> it's a part of me and it's, it's a part that I can't ignore. And if it takes four hours a day, I'll do it. <laughs> In a way, the way that we perceive creativity has changed, changed with times. We don't see knitting as a necessity anymore. It's more a craft. We do not see I mean, the value of music in terms of what we used to see music. We didn't have TV, we didn't have radio, so, but what we do, would do, we would have someone sit down and play an instrument and that would entertain us. Creativity is about doing something you enjoy. If you're not enjoying doing something that you believe to be creative, then it's not really creative, I don't think. When you find a piece that resonates with you and a thought and a feeling, it's easier to release that through your hands. So the emotions in your, you know, in your heart, you know, your thought process can escape. It's just a beautiful healing way to do that through art. We used to write letters, journals, inspirations, poems, things that would draw us in. We don't write letters anymore, but we're typing on computers. Doesn't mean the way we think has changed, it's the way we use our talent has changed. I think through a lot of things while I'm creating, a lot of that starts to just subconsciously come into what I'm doing. It never ends up what I thought I was going to do in the first place. When I left school, I thought I'm either going to be an artist or a scientist. 
and then quickly discovered you also need money. I wanted to get back into something creative because I felt that I had unfinished business. So I feel like I've kind of started where I left off and just discovering it's just like everything's waking up again. What surprised me in this creative process is that I want to do everything and when I go to do it, I have no idea what I'm going to do. So I go, I go from too many ideas to complete shutdown. That's the exciting thing, what will start being expressed. One of the things that surprised me in coming back to art is how personal it is and how revealing. At times it can feel quite confronting because you realise you're doing something so personal. There's a lot of opportunity to reveal subconsciously what's going on inside. It doesn't have to be so overt. So I think that's part of the creative process that I want to develop more. Hello, pup. Rosie. Hello. <laughs> we got our chickens during lockdown. One day, we actually found a letter in our a post box addressed for the chickens with a nice little drawing on the front and a little picture in there just saying, you know, we love your chickens, thank you for sharing them with us. But it's like we didn't know what to do with this letter, like who's it from, we don't know. And then Penrith City Council had the Free Your Creative Spirit campaign and they wanted local artists to do things to be interactive and creative. And I thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll draw something on the, the path. Oh, I discovered at first I didn't know how to draw a chicken, so. <laughs> we started with this picture of Philippa. I was just looking at the shapes, what it could look like. I came up with this weird sketch that starts off with the love heart and gradually builds up to form a chicken. So that any child could follow the steps, paper one up to paper 12 step by step. It became part of this image, which was Philippa and Rosie writing a letter. I think the chicken story has really spoken to a lot of people. I think a lot of people love hearing about Philippa and Rosie getting a letter. So I'm writing a book about Philippa and Rosie receiving a letter and I've done my first picture, this one. <laughs> So yeah, I've got picture number one done, got the story. So now it's, it's my aim to write a book. Someone said to me once many years ago, don't discount what you find easy because it's usually what you're good at. Uh, my mum used got me some cheap acrylic paints Kids like to hear, you know, someone say, oh, wow, that's nice. And I just never grew out of it, I suppose. A lot of people think because you, you paint the real world, you, there's no creativity there, but everything you do, that you're creating because you're trying to get that illusion of depth and the illusion of reality on a flat surface. I just get my inspiration from the visual world. It's mostly the light and I just see things and I think, well, you know, look at the light on that and look at how that works and, and the composition of it. So this is an image I took of an old church that I just saw in my travels. It's an interesting old structure. And I looked at the old tree and the wooden construction of the church with the textures and peeling paint. I've also got a photo here of some cows. I'm going to use a couple of those cows just as a bit of, as models. Now we, we really need to just work on those cows, try to make them believable, and uh, maybe a few more shadows here and there, and uh, it should be done. And so sometimes there's only a hint of what I want there, but I know I can change it up to, to make a painting out of it. The inspiration is from what I see. There's no messages in my art. I'm not trying to make a story or, or anything like that.
apart from my art practice itself, I'm also president of the Nepean Art Society, so that yeah, takes up a bit of time. It's good to get amongst other artists and put your work up too, because then you get a bit of a gauge of how you're going. When you're painting out outdoors, plain air, it's, sometimes people will come along and they'll stop and have a look. And how long does it take? This is one of the favourite questions. How long does it take to paint that? And often you, if a watercolour, and I say, oh, about three hours, and they go, oh, you know, it's like, oh, it can't be worth much then, <laughs> you know. <laughs> the other part of that answer is, it takes it took three hours to paint, but it took me 50 years of practice to be able to do that. Always looking at other artists and, and at their work or at them painting if I can get the opportunity. And you learn a lot from that. Every Thursday we have a group of us who we go out to the different areas here and we paint. It's more instant and I really like that. I, I don't do a lot of landscape but I've learned to love it going through that group. And there's a lot more groups like that here now which I'm loving. So when we moved here, this was a country area. I did feel a little bit left out and I really felt a little bit lost because from an Asian background, I think we were the only ones in the classroom for many years. I think I withdrew a little bit more. When I'm either under stress or even if I'm feeling happy, I tend to go to my drawings. And I think it influenced a lot of my work. I have never really done a painting for my mum. Her 70s now and she's retired and she just loves her garden. And I watch her every time I go there or if she meets someone, she'll give them a plant. Because that's her way of saying, oh, you know, I, I like you, I'll give you a plant. What I experience, that's what inspires me. When we moved here, the first thing I saw was that front door and it reminded me of a door that would be in a gallery with because it has squares so I thought oh, you know what this deserves to be painted on like a real gallery you know and I thought my kids would love to just get in there I gave them two squares each and anyone else that wanted to join in and then I finished it off to make it look like a painting I'm actually a nurse, that's my profession, but I've always been doing art and painting. I think I was born more so to be an artist. I always think that's probably in life, it's uh, that combination has given more of a feel to what, how I paint now. Because it's not just when I'm experiencing things in, in life, all those experiences that I've had as a nurse, as a mother, as a person, it's all in my work. A lot of my work is based on life itself and I think it's my inspiration. They really connect. I think it was meant to be that way. <laughs> There's a lot of things that um, I need to work on <laughs> and a lot of things that I can do that I'm surprised that I can do. If I look at something and, I, and I'm visualising it, I have to draw a lot to get it that way. And maybe my first 10 sketches doesn't look like anything that I've got in my mind. But I keep drawing and drawing and then, then, then I'll mix it with photography. So I'll then go out there and look at things that might represent what I'm thinking. At the end, when I've actually com completed the painting, then I'm surprised. And that's what makes me happy too, because it, it's an accomplishment that I didn't think I'd have. My dream was to travel Europe and be a painter. Went to work and I put that all to the side, then I picked it back up again painted for a few years, put it back down again, and I put it back down about 10 years ago and didn't pick it back up until my son passed away. 
It was a late night conversation with Dylan. One of his childhood memories was paintbrushes in my hair and singing and painting very late at night for downtime. Dylan and I were Googling late one night and I wanted to do something that represented him. We looked up artwork that created movement. We came up with alcohol inking. Each piece now represents his life or his journey through life. It's hard to describe, 100% isopropyl and it's ink, so it's special alcohol ink. Once you put the ink into the alcohol and you move it with a heat gun, it activates and you're able to move it around and you, it's about moving it back and forth to create the lines until you get what you're after. Each piece is very different. I couldn't create the same piece if I tried because it's the movement of the alcohol and the ink together. So whether I'm having a really bad day and I may be thinking about Dylan a lot, I sort of resonate to the colour that draws me to it and I just trust the process. I have done some drawings. It brings a lot of peace. It really does. I did a grief piece and I couldn't explain how I was feeling and it's called Three Faces of Grief and it was like I was screaming on the inside but I couldn't express that. I didn't have any words or enough words to describe the pain that I was feeling so I actually, I did it through my artwork. It was very powerful when I'd finished it. And it's the same with every thought process. People that have been traumatised, it's another way to release that. For me, I guess, I just want people to be able to express trapped traumas and feelings and grief in a different way and make it beautiful. Like there is something beautiful at the end of that grief, if that makes sense. I work with the social workers over at St George Hospital. Donate the money straight through to Red Rose and then it goes to the ward that Dylan was on. So it helps with people's funerals or bills. It's what they need. It's very personalised. With so much sadness can have so much positivity at the end of the day. And that's, I guess that's what Dylan's legacy is about too. You know, out of something bad and something horrific and everybody else that's suffering, there can always be something positive at the end and it's what we do with that. And I guess that's what my artwork's about at the end of the day. It's about moving forward and finding a way to do that very gracefully and to be able to do that and help others. There is mother's love. I think, you know, as parents, as mothers, you know, we always find a positive at the end of something. Especially losing a child, you've got to find a way to keep that, that person alive. And this keeps Dylan alive, which means, you know, it keeps my memories alive as well. I think creativity, it's, it is about revealing what's happening inside. Being creative can be very vulnerable. That's why people get a little bit scared about creating. It's a beautiful way to escape from, you know, the crazy life that we live in. It's a self-discovery, even if it is just a picture of a, a chicken or a, a pair of slippers. Um, there's, there's just something more to it. There's always a, a thing where you think, oh, it's never going to be good enough, so let's not just try it. I think that's where the mistake happens. You know, people just see imperfections in our narratives, but, you know, it's just, I suppose it's part of life, isn't it? It's always that moment of like, well, what if somebody doesn't like it? Or, you know, what other people think about it? I would say give it a go. Follow your nose. Pick something up. It doesn't feel like a burden to me because I love what I do. I love practising. I love goal setting and watching those goals become reality. Everyone's got their own field that they're in. Everyone's got to have a, their own thought process on what they do. 
some people just take to cooking and they just cook amazing meals and they think well that's that's nothing that's not a skill but it, it actually is you know and because they find it easy they just discount it find your community because if you find your community then you've got other people to bounce ideas off you've got other people who feel the same way about you as things and then you you can do whatever it is that you want to do with that that's not so you don't yeah, you know, tear your hair out from time to time, but overall the process ought to be something that you enjoy doing. Always a West Ham, yes.